Hello! We're live from the Texas Book Fest inside the Capitol. Uh, we're here for the Austin 360 Book Club and we're with Austin author Amy Gentry. We're very excited to have her here. I'm Sharon Chapman. I'm the Features Editor at the Austin American Statesman here with... I'm Katie Pinchick. I work for Gatehouse Media, the uh, parent company of the Statesman, but I spent two years with Austin 360. And so we're here to talk about Good Is Gone, which was our October book club selection. Amy is going to read a little bit from the book and talk about it. Amy, who grew up in Houston, Houston's a big character in the book. Uh, That's right. I'll let you take it away. Okay, I'll have to find the. Since this isn't my copy, it's going to take oh, me just one <laughs> She's going to read a little bit for but us. But I will yeah. say that I'm going to go ahead and read something from pretty early in the book, because uh, I don't want to do any major spoilers. Um, and just in case, I know people, I know you've all read it already, but um, just well, in case I, someone hasn't. <laughs> I was going to add, there might be some mild spoilers. We'll try not yeah. to spoil too much. We're going to try to not it, talk about the big reveal, discussion. but yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, this is a, a, a thriller set in Houston. And it starts with a family in the wake of trauma after a, um, their young teenage girl, 14, has been kidnapped out of the bedroom uh, in the middle of the night at knife point while her younger sister, Jane, uh, watches from the closet, hidden, okay? So this is a horrible event we, that obviously tears the family apart. Um, but really the book is about a moment that starts eight years later um, when the family has kind of been struggling and limping along through this trauma for eight years. Hope is pretty low um, at this point. Uh, for, for Julie's return, and Julie is the name of the kidnapped girl. So the part I'm going to read happens uh, really early on. It's just um, the beginning of chapter two, so I promise it's not really a spoiler. Um, and it's from the point of view um, of Anna, who's Julie's mother. And the, po the book is mostly written from Anna's point of view. The first thing I see is her pale hair, all lit up in the rosy, polluted glow of the Houston sunset. Then her, oh, I should say there was a knock at the door. <laughs> They're all sitting down to family dinner and Anna gets up, there's a knock at the door. She goes and opens it. Okay. Then I see her face, ashen skin stretched thin over wide cheekbones, flushed red across the top so that the dark circles stand out under her sunken eyes. The face looks both young and old. She wears worn out jeans with holes at the knees, a t-shirt. She opens her mouth to speak, and I see that her feet are bare. There's something familiar about her, but it's like my entire body has become fused with my surroundings, my brain rewired to resemble blind hands fumbling, the sensory data bumping uselessly around in search of something to latch onto, hair, eyes, young, bare. Her eyes widen, and the color drains from her face. My hands stretch out in front of me, palms out, Fingers spread wide, ready to shield me from the nuclear sunset, or as if I'm about to fall down, but it's the girl on the porch who falls, her knees buckling so that she folds up neatly as she collapses onto the mat, blonde hair catching lightly in the azalea bushes on her way down. I open my mouth, and I think I must be yelling for Tom, although I can't hear it because my brain is still blinded by the sunset glancing off her face. He comes running up behind me, stops, and then thunders through the doorway. When I look again, the girl has all but vanished in his arms, the loops and tangles of her hair crushed between his fingers as he hugs her to his chest, rocking back and forth. Julie, 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 he is sobbing, like the chorus of the nightmares that I now know have never stopped, but have been unreeling every night for eight years, and perhaps all day long as well, in a continuous stream I have simply chosen to deny. The sight of Jane standing stock still in the, in the hallway flips the light switch back on in my head. Call 911, I manage to say. Tell them we need an ambulance. To Tom, who is making strange animal sounds of grief I have also heard in my dreams, I say, bring her in. And just like that, the worst unhappens. Julie is home. So the excerpt. And if you have read even the back of the book, you know that it's not that simple. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to fix the live stream real fast. Sharon, you want to? Oh, yeah. No, I was going to say that gave me chills hearing you read it out loud, even though I'd already read it. And it, I just sort of like a visceral reaction. It was really intense. And it made me think of something that I thought of as I was reading the book uh, was that you really captured 
what it's like to have a trauma in a family and the sort of marker and time that that puts in the family's timeline of like the before and after because nothing's the same mm -hmm. and even though now their daughter is home and again and it's on the back of the book you kind of get the hint <laughs> that is it julie is it not julie mm -hmm. uh and just i don't know if you if that was a running theme that you intended or just mm -hmm. kind of grew out the characters if you want to talk about capturing that sort of what trauma does to people and yeah. how it changes everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the book really is about trauma, the effects of trauma both on the character who calls herself Julie and on the family who has been missing her all these years. Um, and I did want to, um, I did want to look particularly at the way that trauma disrupts chronology. Um, the way that a single event can sort of come to retroactively define even, even parts of your life that happened beforehand, right? Um, and I wanted to capture the way it's almost like a sinkhole, you know, afterward, kind of everything is sort of upside down in the wake of this, um, in the wake of this event that has just changed the meaning of the whole family, basically forever. And the kind of line, that last line in that section, when she says, the worst unhappens, just like that, is meant to almost have a, a double meaning. It's, like, it's ironic because um, it can never, you know, there's not such a word as unhappens. Because once something has happened, it has happened. It will never be corrected. Um, so that's kind of, I think, part of what the book is about. Um, yeah. And also you just touched on how trauma affects your past and I think there's a real interesting exploration that Anna goes through. It's not just her daughter's back but looking back at her relationship with her other daughter and her husband and she almost relives parts of her life. Do you want to talk about that and, and kind of sees that the reality that she thought was true wasn't maybe necessarily true back then? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? That was fascinating to me. Like. Yeah looking back and being like, wait, was I wrong about what mm. was happening in my own life? Yeah, well, um, I, I want to ask yeah. you about a specific, <laughs> what specific passage you're thinking about, if it's okay. not a spoiler, but yeah. I, I will say that um, this is kind of a wonderful feature of the genre of domestic thrillers that I love, and this is one reason I really was excited to be writing in this genre, because um, domestic thrillers are basically about that moment when you look at somebody who's been lying next to you for 20 years or who's your daughter that you've known since birth or your mother and suddenly think oh my god do I even know this person at all um, you know it's it's about that kind of revelatory wake up I mean they're also they tend to be pretty paranoid right as well because uh, oftentimes the event that spurs this recognition is that the, the protagonist is in danger suddenly from somebody they've known all their life um, so that was kind of, um, I mean, that's a general way of answering the question, and I do, and I love that about almost all domestic thrillers. I think um, it's it's the thing that scares me most um, more than monsters, which I know will never show up in my life. I hope. Uh, and I think um, even when I was writing this book. Uh, well, when I got the idea for this book, actually, it was uh, a long time before I, I started actually writing it. Um, but the idea came to me when I myself was uh, fresh out of college, like a, a young woman about the age that the Julie character is in this novel. And I think subconsciously there must have been some part of me that felt um, that I was unrecognizable to my mom. Right, <laughs> and the IED, and 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 I think like now as a mother, I, as a mother now, you know, twenty years later, I feel um, that there's a there's a real truth to that that all parents kind of, in a metaphorical sense, have a, a, a moment when they they wake up and look at their child and are like, oh my God, who are you? <laughs> uh, and uh, and so I think that theme was really like. Um, you know, really resonated with me, and I think it made its way into the book without my even really, um, yeah, necessarily intending it to. Um, but yeah, I'm curious about any particular flashback moments that you were thinking of. I think it was her relationship with Jane, and I oh, forgot yeah. to mark it in the book, but her younger daughter, their relationship is not that great in the wake of all of this, mm -hmm. and uh, you get the sense that maybe Julie was her favorite kid, even though parents aren't mm -hmm. supposed to say that. Yeah. And uh, sort of just what, how it broke her relationship with Jane. Yeah. And But then it's kind of, you know, there's a healing that maybe happens. I don't want to give anything away, but, mm -hmm. but that when she looked back and kind of realized that she wasn't seeing Jane 
maybe as she really was, that really struck me. And it reminded me of someone said to me in my early 20s, right after college, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to move away from your family mm -hmm. because otherwise you're forever <laughs> seen as the kid and yeah. they need to like, get to know you as an adult. And yeah. sometimes, you know, you're stuck in that. Yeah. And then move back. And I did move away from my family and then not, I mean, because for a job, not because I wanted to get away from them. And uh, when <laughs> I moved back as an adult, yeah. <laughs> but when I moved back as an, as an older adult and lived close to them again, it, it changed our relationship in yeah. a good way. And we got to know each other in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the younger daughter, Jane, I actually have a, like, she has a special place in my heart because I'm a youngest daughter. I like her um, a lot. Mm -hmm. I love her too. A lot of people hate her. Oh, I'm she's so kind I of a brat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of why I liked her. Me too. <laughs> she had a hard role in that family after yeah, Julie was gone. I mean, well, was I mean, first of all, she actually witnessed the kidnapping, so that is in itself a trauma that, um, unfortunately, in this family, gets kind of swept under the rug because yeah. there's just more important, you know. I mean, the the, the loss of the older daughter is just so overwhelming as it would be that it kind of turns into this black hole that all the other things going on in the family just vanish in the wake of this this bigger disaster so um yeah jane becomes uh who knows if she would have been what she would have been like right but she becomes this kind of you know rebellious teenager not particularly um dangerously so because i think jane is uh got you know scared really young and I think she kind of has a really tough survival instinct that's how she made it through that initial experience but she dyes her hair different colors and she wears clothes that her mother doesn't approve of and she's and she wants to get as far away as possible because she feels that she hasn't really necessarily been seen in the wake of this event her um, she could never be loud enough really to attract attention after this happens right and the fact that she too has lost her anchor. I mean, as a youngest child, your older siblings are kind of, I mean, they're like, you're in the trenches with them. They're the ones who understand you more than your parents in some cases. And so her anchor is also gone, but no one is stepping in to make that to, you know, because they're too busy just tending their own wounds and, and reeling through their own lives. So, and there, there is again, the, the father is an interesting figure in this, he kind of, he's the one who recognizes Julie right away um, in, the, in the excerpt that I read. And he remains throughout, um, he's a friend of Jane, you know, mm -hmm. he gets along fine with, more or less fine with Jane. And, uh, and you know, he, as soon as Julie comes home, he's happy. His, to him, the book is closed and his, you know, greatest wish has been fulfilled. He doesn't look it in the mouth. <laughs> Like the gift horse in the mouth but um so we're kind of set up i think to believe that tom is um you know kind of this pure wholesome being as opposed to the narrator who's um pretty difficult and complicated woman but we see kind of toward the end of the book that in fact trauma has rewritten all of their stories including tom so nobody is really exempt from uh tragedy in in this book my hope let's say <laughs> I think that definitely comes through and, yeah. and also that it doesn't have to that there is a healing though too in a way or can be we don't I hope know so. yeah. I hope so yeah you kind of want a sequel how are they doing now oh <laughs> god I don't know people ask me if Anna and Tom are together all the time yeah I, yeah, I wondered that at the end too yeah. Yeah. yeah honestly I don't know I mean I don't want to spoil anything for you about their relationship and where it goes but even without the events of the book losing a child is the pretty much the hardest thing that can happen to on a, in a marriage, I think. And um, so many couples dissolve in the wake of that kind of tragedy. And it's one thing that I, you know, one thing that I kind of, that motivated me in writing the book about all the characters, including the Julie character, is just, I wanted to portray a more sort of realistic picture in this somewhat stretch of plausibility situation or like very rare situation um, but I wanted their reactions to feel really real and I didn't want to have any interest in portraying uh, anyone as a martyr or um, you know I, I think that the way people behave in the wake of trauma is they try to survive it however they can and there are no you know perfect victims and people don't behave perfectly and you know Anna and Tom's marriage um, at the end of the book, we'll just say, even at the beginning of the book, it's sort of, it's changed. Whether or not that means they can ever 
you know, they find some healing, but does that mean that they're gonna make it to the next <laughs> chapter in life? Yeah. Honestly, I kind of don't know. Yeah, and I would never, I don't think I will ever write a sequel to this book, but if I did, it wouldn't be, the character that would go on from this book would not be um, from the family, it would be Alex Mercado, the oh. private investigator. Oh. <laughs> ah, that would be great. The Alex, Alex Mercado series. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. he's Detective a PI Steve. that Anna, that Anna meets in the course of everything. And yes. He is kind of a fascinating yeah. character. I mean, in not a lot of. Uh, you, he's a character, but you don't spend a ton of time on him. But you really get a great sense of him. I and, love him. Yeah. <laughs> He was involved in the investigation when Julie first Initially, disappeared. Right, yeah. and That's then, right. He so was on the force when Julie was taken, and he had it's personal for him. That yeah, would be a great series. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think if that. I if I read, read more about Houston, I think it would be around Alex Mercado's next adventure, and I I think I would probably find a way to check back in with this family because Mercado is very like invested in this in these uh, mm -hmm. Folks, so then we could maybe find out if how Anna and Tom are doing, but we'll see. Her <laughs> kidnapping changed the course of his life too. Yes, yeah. it did. In a very yeah. direct way. That, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you, you know, mentioning setting books in Houston, I think that that's one of the things we talked about in our meeting about this earlier this week. Is I don't think either of us have read any books set in Houston. Like, what what was really? that? Or fiction books? I guess. Well, Houston Especially was such a thriller. character too. It was such a character yeah. and. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Houston, deciding to set your book there, and um, your new book that's coming out in January is set in Austin, so reading um, that as somebody who pretty much grew up in Austin, that was kind of a weird experience for me, so what is it like for you to kind of fictionalize these places that are very real to you? Does yeah, that make sense? yeah. Well, it's definitely easier to fictionalize a place that you've lived in than one that you haven't, I will say that. <laughs> Um, and that is kind of how I ended up setting it in Houston, strangely. I really uh, fought against it for a long time, and I wanted to I wanted to set it in Colorado Springs for a while, and then San Francisco. I had this whole, probably 10,000 words written in San Francisco that were specific to San Francisco. And um, in the end, it just, nothing really felt right for the family. And I started, like when I was thinking about like the perfect what would make the perfect location for this. I just, I wanted it to be somewhere that had that Houston sprawl, for one thing. Um, I wanted it to be a place that was big and anonymous, where you could be encased in a car and just, you know, you're on those freeways and just who knows like what you're passing, right? Um, and in fact, there's a passage at the opening of the book where Anna is, driving down like I-10 I and she's um, she's just thinking like she's just clocking all the billboards and all the you know and the mega church here and the this there and you know she thinks like how many missing girls are there in this city they could be anywhere this city is full of them um, so to me that was part of like when I stopped fighting it <laughs> I kind of found that for one thing it was it was still plenty hard to write the book, even with the even taking this cop out of setting it in my hometown. Um, but it gave me thematically. I realized that actually my feelings about the the plot and the characters really sprang out of that soil. Um, and and in fact, the book is set like pretty much right where I right where my parents still live, um, kind of in the Spring Branch area um, around like uh, Memorial and uh, Loop 6, or Highway 6, if you know it. Um, so it's a pretty specific, like the energy corridor, it's a pretty specific locale, even within Houston. And it's a place I think of as being pretty sheltered. Um, you know, it's a nice, like, nice two-story homes and big lawns, like watered year-round. And um, so I kind of wanted, um, I wanted to get that sense of, the thing that happened to them, you know, truly felt like, you know, an invasion from some great unknown uh, that came into their sort of sheltered, happy little lives. Um, and it also gives you a little context for Jane, too, afterward, growing up. She remains a pretty sheltered kid, um, you know, perhaps more so because uh, 
because of what happened in her family, but also because it's just a sheltered place to grow up, as I know well. One of my favorite things to write is when they go, the sisters, the sisters, as we think, are reunited, um, and Julie and Jane get to spend time together alone. And that was kind of one of my favorite scenes to write because they go in, they go in on Westheimer, which is where we used to go when I was a teenager trying to escape the suburban feel of Spring Branch. We would go in and go to Montrose and maybe Rice Village and like all these pockets of what I thought of as like real, you know, real life and like Cool party yeah, cool yeah. stuff, vintage <laughs> stores, like, and so Jane, I, Jane, like, I think that is the, maybe the turning point when I actually did decide, yes, on Houston, is when I thought, where would Jane go? And the only thing I could think of was she climbs into the family SUV and drives down Westheimer. So, <laughs> I love that. That's that, danger for her. <laughs> that was a great scene, too, because, uh, because the book is a thriller. We still, at that point, don't know what who Julie is, what her motives are, and it, I was a little on edge wondering, is she going to do something bad to Julie? Yeah, because it seems, like it's, it seems like it could either be this like very pure moment between mm. sisters or something horrible could happen. Yeah. Where, you know, Julie does something crazy and, you know, hurts somebody or, you know, and yeah, it's it just this really moment of just like, too. I yeah. have no idea what's about to happen. Well, uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> But also the sister relationship was strong too, so that yeah. was, it was really, it worked on a lot of levels, I thought. Well, you know, um, I should also say that that part of the book is written from Julie's point of view, or I should say Julie slash not Julie, question mark. <laughs> um, and the, those parts of the book were really fun to write, but also kind of stressful because writing from inside someone's point of view and not giving away whether it's really her, that's her sister or not. <laughs> And there's one particular moment where Jane, Jane is really trying to reestablish this connection. Um, and she's throwing out these memories from when they were little and they went to the Galleria and, um, with their parents for Christmas shopping and all this stuff. And Julie is kind of reacting to this, um, you know, in, in kind of a weird way. And that was an interesting scene to have to work through a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, try and preserve, preserve the mystery so that it could go either way from her point of view. Yeah. I want to make sure we have enough time to ask our what people our want to know the question, most about. Yeah, is, I posted in our Facebook group asking if people had questions for you and everyone was very curious about your decision to kind of shift perspectives within mm -hmm. the novel and also tell certain parts of the story in a reverse yeah. chronological order. It was it was at first it was kind of jarring and then it made a lot of sense, I felt like, toward the end of the book as we kind of started figuring out what was going yeah. on. But I don't think I've read a book that shifted both perspectives and like time like that before. And I think it really worked in the end. Yeah. I will say it. I, you heard it here, folks. Yeah, if you read it, I think if you read it in a traditional chronological order, it might not have had as much impact. I'm right, sure, the big but. reveal I don't think would have been as, like, yeah. revealing. Well, that's the thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure whether I would do that ever again. It was an incredible pain to write that way. <laughs> um, when I, in the process did you make that decision, and did you get resistance from your editor? That was another question. Yeah, people oh, were asking if your no, editor was in, cool with it. In, in fact, that was the thing that made me no, I could write the book. Um, I had had the idea, as I said, like over 10 years previous and had never really worked on it because I, I don't know why, I just couldn't figure out how I would make it work. And then I was sort of thinking about it again and the structure, when I thought of that structure, I thought, ah, this is it. I'm going to alternate um, viewpoints and one timeline will go forward from present you know, through the investigation. The detective work that Anna does goes forward in time. And then when we see Julie's perspective, we, um, or the character, then we, we see her from the present and then going back into the past. So each successive Julie section is what happened just before the last one. And that is very confusing. If you think it's confusing to read, <laughs> you should try writing it. Um, every uh, making it perhaps a little more jarring but i was okay with it being jarring in the beginning as long as you caught on is that the names change in each section so each section is titled um, with a different name that this character has gone under and hopefully after a little bit you can tell 
I don't think it's a spoiler to say that they are the same character. So you're seeing where she's been, but you're also seeing who she's been. And this was really important to me for kind of, you know, looking at the questions of identity, since the big question in the book is, you know, is she or isn't she Julie? Who is she? Um, I wanted to give you kind of a, a rabbit trail to go down. Um, and I wanted to show you all the different girls that anyone can be um, in the, I mean, really any one period, but certainly anyone who's lived through this kind of event. Um, you know, the character, whether she's Julie or not, you will find out that she has been through some very, very upsetting stuff. Um, and that her, her coping strategies have involved casting aside an old identity and putting on a new one as quickly as she can and getting into a new situation. Um, so, <laughs> but that answers when I had right. the I was, yeah, yeah. question. But yeah, um, th what was the other part Just, of it? Just what made you decide to do yeah, that? Yeah, that? Why did you feel like that was the best way to tell the story? It was really baked into the book. As soon as I decided that Julie had to have a point of view, um, I think when I first thought of the book, it was always from Anna's point of view, which is a little surprising given that I thought of it when I was 22, but I always had Anna's voice in my head. And at some point I was like, I think this isn't going to work unless we let this traumatized girl kind of have her say. And it was very hard because she is a very elusive character and she did not want, I felt even as an author that I was being kind of like shut out. It was very hard to get into that headspace. Um, but then once I figured out that she had to be in the book, the book almost had to be arranged that way because a point of view character um, whose identity is up in the air. Like, we, you know what I'm saying? We would have known very quickly whether it was her or not based on how she behaves, based on her internal monologue during the present day. But going back in time, finding out where she was just before this, um, tells you about the character little by little and hopefully keeps you turning pages to find out, but also unfolds this character in a way that, you know, by the end, the two timelines finally intersect and you kind of you, you know you're gonna you know you're gonna find out if we keep going further back and back you know we're eventually gonna find out whether it's her or not and I tried to hopefully arrange it so that it had the maximum impact when you do find out Definitely. it did yeah yeah, yeah it, it did. definitely is yeah. um, you touched on this a little bit earlier but I wanted to ask you about you've worked with survivors um, before of domestic violence sexual violence what was that like for you writing this book and your new book, mm -hmm. um, which touches on very similar themes, what was it like? What perspective do you think that brought to the process of writing? Yeah, um, I was volunteering the most actually while I was writing Good Is Gone, and I have not for a while because things got kind of crazy. I had a baby. Uh, <laughs> so it's been a little while um, since I worked with them, but SAFE, the organization I worked with, um, ha sends volunteers to meet people in the emergency room um, who request uh, rape exams, so in, in the immediate aftermath of their traumas. Um, I don't think I, you know, I didn't, that's not why I was writing, I was already writing the book, but I think those themes um, came, became more crystallized through the stories I heard from women who had been in the situations I was writing about. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say, it's like I was volunteering for the same reason that I was writing this book, which is that I am really, um, I mean, these issues mean a lot to me and I am, I'm thinking about them all the time. I see them all around me, so that's what I'm writing. Um, but yeah, having contact with particularly the, the, the diversity of women, um, just every age and demographic you can imagine, who have been in these situations was extremely sobering and um, gave me a sense particularly for um, the, the Julie character's past, right? So in every life she, she is running toward or away from some of these traumas, right? And the idea is, um, people have actually written me to say, I don't think it's realistic that all this stuff would have happened to the same woman. And let me tell you, it is realistic. That's exactly who um, people get re-traumatized um, in the wake of um, sexual and domestic violence. Those are those women tend to be vulnerable, especially vulnerable to 
um, future occasions. So I kind of, um, yeah, I wanted to kind of explore those with the Julie character who, as I say, came, her voice came last to me. So I really was developing her voice, I think, at the same time that I was meeting women um, who had been in those situations. And, um, and the last thing I'll say about that, just to, because I always want to say it, is that I really wanted to depict um, a, a female trauma victim who was not perfect or well-behaved or honest or um, exemplary in any way, right? Um, but who behaved believably in the wake of very real trauma that really did happen, right? And I think we have a big cultural blind spot around um, female survivors of sexual violence especially, but also domestic violence where if they're not behaving perfectly, if they didn't have a perfect record, if they were taking drugs or other things, then somehow that invalidates the fact that they were the victims of a very serious crime. And I really wanted the character of Julie, I mean it's great because she's, it's a thriller so you also have to not trust her, <laughs> but it really plays on that, um, our own innate um, I guess, wish for victims to behave perfectly and our feelings of betrayal when they don't. Um, and hopefully helps illuminate that um, really serious blind spot. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that sort of judgmental thing that we can sometimes go to, which is- Yeah, absolutely. your gut reaction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And how, again, it goes back to that theme of trauma changes everything and mm -hmm. can change a person decision making and oh absolutely I mean it changes, changes their brain core ability being, yeah your it brain has on effects trauma. on your brain yeah. that um, that cause uh, your judgment to in some cases be impaired in ways um, I mean yeah we're st that we get a little training as part of the safe training we get a lot of um, you know we have sort of a unit on the effects of trauma and it's really pretty staggering um, the, the long-term effects even so um, yeah so I wanted to kind of give a make room for that depiction to come alive in the novel and hopefully people heard it. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I want to take a few minutes to I talk about <laughs> um, your new book that's coming out, the other book that oh, you have out, great. and um, <laughs> then we'll open it up and see if anybody here has some questions. No pressure if you don't. Um, but yeah, will you just tell us a little bit about your new book that's sure. coming out? Yeah. Which I got a preview copy of it, and it's very good. I <laughs> read it in like two days. To show people um, yeah, so yeah. you want to show them what it looks yeah. like? I have the, 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 the galley, <laughs> so you get to see the cover before anyone else. <laughs> Here it is! Yay. Yay. And this comes out in January, right? Yeah, this comes yeah. out in January. It's called Last Woman Standing. and. Um, what, I don't know, what do I, I'm not used to talking about it yet, it's all very new. <laughs> you can um, work it out here. <laughs> yeah, it's a story set half in Austin and half in LA, actually. Mm -hmm. And the main character, Dana Diaz, is a stand-up comic in Austin, who's uh, not doing that great in Austin at, at comedy. Um, she's kind of been in LA, didn't make it, came back, and when the book opens, is basically trying to figure out how to get back. Uh, back to LA um, and how to kind of get her feet under her again and what you kind of find out really quickly is that she had some things happen to her in LA which you know spoiler alert but they some of them resemble things that have happened to there were some very direct <laughs> mirror yeah. images to some recent pop culture happenings yeah, yeah some things I uh, think about that I, I had already started writing the book and had settled on the kind of character she interacts with in LA who's a, a big comic a famous comic um, and then a certain story came out this spring when I was already late in the revision process and suddenly a comics name was very prominent in the Me Too the burgeoning at that time just starting Me Too movement and um, so all I have to say is the character was not really based on that character but now it's going to be that character in everyone's mind so uh, that was yeah that yeah. was my first thought and, yeah I, but, but i thought you fair. had started it before so i was yeah. like you like foretold the future in no, some way it, um but i i wanted in this book actually um there are some of the same themes um the hook is that she she meets a, a random stranger dana meets a random stranger who is a woman who was forced out of the tech industry in a similar way that she was forced out of the comedy industry. And um, over, over a drink one night, they say that they should go after each other's um, attackers. They kind of make this revenge swap. 
and uh, clink glasses and take a shot and Dana thinks that's the last of it because it's a funny joke because uh, that's how she sees life but it's not the last definitely of it. not a joke <laughs> definitely not a joke oh, wow. um, yeah and and just a, uh, just a brief word about kind of where it was coming from with the themes that resonate with good as gone in last woman standing um, I had looked at something in Good as Gone that is very rare, which is a kidnapping of that nature. It was based on a, somewhat on a real case, Elizabeth Smart. So we know that, that this does happen, but vanishingly rare in terms of um, our experience. Last Woman Standing was my attempt to look more at the things that almost everyone has been through, women. Um, the kind of um, abuse and harassment that we sort of all, if it hasn't happened to us, it's definitely happened to someone we know and probably multiple instances. So it was kind of, I was trying to get a little bit more fine-grained, um, you know, in, 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 and uh, it's hard to build a thriller around relatable stuff. <laughs> but that was the goal, so you'll have to tell me if it worked. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it worked. I thought it was great. I loved it. So January, be great. ready. Great. And we're our, we are running out of time. We're running out of time. Do you want to make a you quick right have... turn and mention the book that you're yeah. here signing Which is not uh, a at noon today? <laughs> yeah. It's part of the 33 and a third series. Do you want to explain what that is? And your yeah, just really quickly, it's a series of books. Each book is about one album, and um, I have written my uh, my entry in the series on Tori Amos's Boys for Pele, her 1996 album. Uh, so there's a panel on that at 3.30 today, and it also involves Jessica Hopper, who's an amazing music writer, really important um, lady who has a great book out called Night Moves. So if you're around at 3.30, maybe you want to pop in, see how we're doing there. <laughs> it's in this extension, room 14, I believe. Yeah, okay. just I looked like it up right earlier. Over yeah. But you're doing a book signing right after this, I think, at noon in yes, the, I am. In the uh, signing tent. Yep. The adult yeah. signing tent. So. Does anybody in the room have any questions for Amy? You don't have to ask them now. You can mingle <laughs> yeah, afterwards if we need time. to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone, and thanks everyone who's watching on Facebook. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really great. So great. Thanks for picking the book. Oh, yeah, we loved it. it. Yeah.